this computer. Okay, we are yeah, now we recording. Timer. Becca, I, I'll do a quick introduction with you, Becca, too. Um, Becca and I met, was it at the the NTL conference or was it, no, it must have been at the- There in Arizona. It was in Arizona? Okay, so a couple of times where we've gotten together for organization development type efforts. And now, in fact, we're in a, an organization development class together. And so we've been chatting about all things OD and KM and just came up that, hey, why don't we do a, a Knowledge Cafe together? And we came up with this topic. People seemed interested. So here we are, a little nervous, a little excited to uh, try it. What do you think, Becca? It's all yours. Great. Thank you, John, for holding the space for all of us together. I look forward to coming to an in-person one and seeing some of your full-bodied selves in, in the room. Um, and uh, thank you all for taking time to gather. I'm excited for the conversations after my few minutes here. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it because I want to get to our conversations. Um, and so as you may remember, we're talking about embodied leadership and what does that look like? And we'll be asking some questions about what does that mean in a virtual world? So I assume based on this group and what John has told me about this group that we all have a pretty solid basic understanding of leadership and probably could have many discussions of what is leadership. For the purposes of this talk, I'm thinking of leadership as a capability that every person has and every person can develop. So I'm not talking about leaders at the top. I'm just talking about leadership as a quality. Um, and that quality, some words that come to mind for me are someone who's in, inspiring, galvanizing, who has tact and grace, um, hopefully some humility and is um, authentic and able to build consensus. So that's where I'm starting with this when I talk about leadership. Um, and so to be a leader, I think we need to have some, a good leader, we ha need to have some intelligence. And when I think of intelligence, I think of three different things. I think of cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence, and then what we'll be talking about today, somatic intelligence. So you all know cognitive intelligence, it's our ability to think and remember and engage in complex ideas, maybe even imagine. And that's you know, measured as what we call IQ. Many of us maybe took some IQ tests as kids and I'm in a preschool search right now for my son. And so that sort of thing is very present of mine for me at the moment. But my priorities are more around what I would call emotional intelligence and somatic intelligence. And so um, the emotional intelligence, as you all know, has been gaining in popularity over the past couple decades and is now generally understood to be much more important for successful leadership than IQ is. And I know that there's other types of intelligence, conversational quotient, social quotient, um, all these various cues. I was joking with John yesterday that maybe we could just all have a BBQ to talk about all of these cues. Um, but what I wanna talk about today is somatic intelligence. And I believe that without developing our somatic intelligence, our effectiveness in, as a leader can only go so far. So what in the world do I mean by somatic intelligence? Um, I, it's, it's your body's intelligence, and really it's about how your body conveys, absorbs, and deals with various types of information. And there are three types of this sensing and working with information that I want to talk about today. There are some others, but we're not going to touch on them. These are the main ones. There's exteroception interoception and proprioception. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time with each of these and I will define them for you. Um, and right before I jump into that, I just wanna remind us that um, humans were, and most animals, were highly adaptive creatures and our systems are always trying to find efficiency. And so there, because there's so much information around us and so much happening within us, our body's going to put stuff on autopilot as often as it can in order to simplify the amount of information that's being communicated and needing to be dealt with at any one time. 
And so while that's great, because we don't have to remember to make our heart beat, it can also be a problem if we have automated certain behaviors that can get lodged and stuck in the body. You know, there's that joke like, oh, don't make that face, your face will get stuck that way. There's actual ways that the body and different energies or habits can get stuck in a physical way within us if we don't bring awareness to them. So by defining these three areas, I wanna bring some awareness for all of us. So let's have a brief experience of exteroception. Just take a moment, take your eyes maybe just beyond the screen. What do you see? Just answer for yourself in your head. What can you smell? Taste. I'm not insulted if any of you are eating lunch. It is lunchtime here on the East Coast. What do you hear? What does the texture of your clothes feel like against your skin? So these are all what we consider to be the five senses, but actually we have many other senses, but the five senses are what are encapsulated with exteroception. And the, these senses have these big, larger nerves that are connected to the brain and communi can communicate information really quickly because as we evolved, we needed to know what was around us, coming toward us, accessible to us, et cetera, in order to survive. Um, however, because there's so much information around us, we can only, um, we can only, thank you, I see Elizabeth's question here that I will type in these terms after I'm done here. Um, so we will, we can only take in and use so much information at a time. And so there's that classic example that may, some of you may have seen at some point in school where there are these people bouncing a ball back and forth and you're supposed to count how many times the ball bounces. And, for so, and at one point this person in a gorilla costume comes on and like beats its chest and then keeps going. And that about 50% of the people don't see that at all because there's this selective taking in of information. And there's also information around us that we can't take in that other creatures can. Like bees can see ultraviolet light, dogs can hear higher pitched sounds. Um, some humans can develop some of these senses more than others depending on their circumstance. Um, so the basic point here is that while we all have more or less the same senses, we live in this physical world of our own making, of the information that we choose to see and subconsciously choose to automate. So that's extero, outside exception, exteroception. Then interoception is what's going on within us. So it's our heart, our lungs, our gut, our skin, and our fascia, which is the lining that surrounds and connects all of our organs and muscles. So for a moment, we're going to experience this interoception. So if you would close your eyes or look down toward the ground if you're not comfortable closing your eyes. And just notice, can you feel yourself breathing? What's happening on the inside of your body as you breathe? Can you feel your heart beating? Most of us have probably at some point felt digestion happening within the body. And if you go a little deeper and just start with the top of your head and scan down your body, are there any places of tension that you can feel inside the body? Are you clenching your jaw? Are your shoulders tight? And as you maybe breathe a little deeper and notice these outward physical sensations, does it at all shift your breathing? Is your breathing a little slower now? Is your heart beating any slower?
And then gently open your eyes and come back together. I'm sorry to pull us out of that quickly. Normally we would take more time, but I'm trying to stay within my 15 minutes here. Um, so this interoception is communication and information that's happening inside of the body, as I said, primarily with the heart, the lungs, the gut, the skin, and the fascia. And what's really cool about this is part of this is the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is the nerve that enervates the heart, the gut, and the lungs directly to the brain. So it bypasses the spinal cord. Your heart, your guts, and your lungs are directly related to your brain. And 90% of the signals that are in that nerve are going to your brain. So we often think that like this is the control center up here, but really information is coming up you're sensing and knowing things with your heart, gut, and lungs. And we have a lot of phrases I'm sure coming to mind for you now in our culture that reflect that, like a gut feeling or it just wasn't in my heart to do it, et cetera. So what's cool is that usually what's going on, again, it's cool because there's other, too much information for our body to handle. Usually like our heart beating, our breathing, et cetera, as we said, it's happening in the background. Our body's taking care of it. Unless there's a problem, and then it sends a signal to the brain and we become conscious of it. Now that's great generally for keeping us alive, but it also can be an issue because there can be sort of a habitual pattern in how our gut, heart, or lungs react to things and we just keep going through the motions of that in our daily lives, when really if we tuned in and paid more attention, we might be able to shift a habitual reaction. Or we might be able to shift a communication if we became a, more aware of these internal feelings as they were happening. Like, so if you feel your chest tightening and then you end up yelling at your kid, maybe if you start to notice the chest tightening, you can begin to shift the actions. So that's briefly on that, and we can talk more about it. And then the final one I want to talk about is proprioception. And proprioception involves your inner ear and the fascia in the body, which, I, again, I said connects everything. So it's about where our body is in space. So just really quickly, like without looking with your eyes, can you feel where your left ear is in relation to your right foot. And everybody has a different amount of proprioceptive awareness. I remember when I was in high school, I, as I was growing up as a child, I did gymnastics and a lot of dance. And so I very much needed to learn to be aware of where my body is in space and how different parts of it relate to other parts of it. But when I was in high school, I remember we were studying for some physics test and we were all around 16 or 17 and a friend was getting his driver's license and he was talking about, yeah, until I started to learn to drive, I just, I, ne I never knew out where my feet were. I never paid attention to my feet or that I had them. And it, I remember it being shocking to me, but that's just for me an example of how, yes, we each have a human body, but our experience of it can be so different and we can learn to use it in different ways over time. Um, and the other thing I wanna say about proprioception is while it is our body in space, how our body is in various positions can impact how we're feeling. So for example, everybody hunch your shoulders over and like look down, maybe cross your arms over your body and then out loud, you're all muted, I think, out loud say, I'm having a great day. And then do the opposite motion of sitting up tall, getting your pelvis under you, shoulders open, chin lifted so your throat is open and say, I'm having a great day. And just little examples of that show us that how our body behaves can really impact how we communicate and can impact how we're feeling. In fact, say you're in an argument with someone and just not feeling good about how it's going, shifting your position can actually shift your physiology and shift the outcome 
of the conversation. So I am almost at time here. So I'm just going to jump down a little bit to the last couple things I wanted to say, which is that, so these three things, exteroception, interoception, and proprioception are the three main parts of what we call somatic or body intelligence. And if you work with each of them, we can begin to become better leaders. So if we're aware of what's going on around us, exteroception, and acknowledge that we have blind spots, we can start to notice more or ask others to help bring information toward us if we think we might be missing something and maybe they are seeing something we aren't. Interoception, as we begin to feel those gut, heart, lung feelings, we can learn to better manage them and better manage ourselves. We can maybe learn to trust our gut more. And proprioception, we can begin to actively engage how our bodies show up in space and what that does for us as leaders, communicators, just general humans who are interacting with each other. So if you buy that somatic intelligence is an integral part of leadership, what does that mean for an increasingly virtual world? And as we break into our little small groups, that's my question. But I also would invite you to spend some time talking to each other about how you experience somatic intelligence, what your experience with it has been or what you might want it to be, and then talk about this question of what does that mean for our increasingly virtual world. Thank you so much for your time. Amazing. Thank you, Becca. We can kind of virtually clap, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. I hear the question just like we had on the site as, uh, say it again one more time, Becca. Sure. So if you buy that somatic intelligence is an integral part of leadership, or even if you don't, just for today's conversation, <laughs> what does that mean for our increasingly virtual world? Gotcha. So, and I, I meant to say, if folks are more interested in this, Amanda Blake, who wrote this book, Your Body is Your Brain, it's a great summary with stories and examples of everything that I was talking about. I pulled some of her language and her organization of this information into my talk because she does such a great job explaining it. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, if you believe in somatic leadership and your body being your brain, the, the, the fun little twist here is just like we're doing right now in Zoom and how many organizations are now doing more and more teamwork is virtual. So how can we bring, if we're not physically in the same space together, but we're now virtual, how does that body intelligence play out? And even just uh, as I saw in the chat, just probably ge uh, a general qu uh, conversation about body intelligence in general. So I'm going to press a button here that's going to pop up a a little box on your screen that'll automatically take you to a breakout room and or you can click a join button. So I'll click start on that. It'll be 15 minutes. I'll give you a five minute warning and a one minute warning. So you get an idea of, of when you'll be coming back. But yeah, let's uh, go into our breakouts and discuss that question. Ready, set, go. Okay. 